Gentlemen, thank you very much. And Juliette is our interpreter at the end for Mr. Jean Dujardin. Um, in the film, Frank says, art is to be held up and admired. Now, given our location here in the National Gallery today, and where in Lida, a monuments man, Cecil Gould, was deputy director, I just wondered if each of you, just to get us warmed up, would name a piece of art that you particularly admire. Grant, could we start with you? Uh, Michelangelo's David is one that... Yeah. Yeah, just uh, every time you see it, it makes you weep. John? Starry Night, Van Gogh. Okay, Bill. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful photograph of. Um, this is a relief picture of the Yankees. <laughs> Mario Mariano Rivera. Mario and Rivera. Mariano. There's one day in baseball when all the baseball players wear number 42, and he was the last person allowed to wear number 42. And they went out to change the, for a pitching change, and there's seven men on the mound all wearing the number 42. <laughs> That's a photo. That's a good that, one. That's a photograph. Yeah. You love, yeah. George? Baseball's huge over here. <laughs> yeah. I'll go down. <laughs> In fact, every one of them nodded when you said, yeah, that's cricket. Yeah, like, oh, Rivera, what? yeah, the all-time saves leader. Sure, yeah. yeah. If you'd said cricket. Uh, I like uh, you, uh, the ones that sort of take your breath away. I, I, I don't think I've ever been more moved than walking in uh, to see the sculpture of the, at the Lincoln Memorial. Okay. Uh, well, yesterday we actually got to see um, Da Vinci's Last Supper, oh. so that's kind of on my brain because we just actually had a, a, a viewing of it to promote the film because um, obviously it's, there's, there's a scene at the beginning of the film where all the Italians are trying to save it, so, so I would say that one. I'm going for a, a more contemporary guy, but it, it, he, an artist named Philip Gustin, he, he does a giant foot that I admire. <laughs> <laughs> Um, mine would be, it's a building, uh, I saw the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona and it was the story really that um, amazed me was that people have worked on it and passed away and then their sons have worked on it and passed away and none of them have actually seen it finished because it's been, um, they've been making it for over 200 years and generations of family have, have, have worked on this building and that, that, I thought that was quite amazing. I believe we are talking about uh pieces of art that um, has meant something to us. Yeah. Uh, well, a uh, piece of art that we have meant uh, something to, uh, I hope, all of you, just like that meant uh, uh, art to me, because it needs to be around us uh, to uh, make life more meaningful, more enjoyable, we would not like life with white walls around us. <laughs> and it was emphasized, I think, yesterday, when, as you've heard, we saw the Last Supper. And I said to myself, there are uh, beautiful views in front, beautiful views in the back, but white walls on the side. It sort of make that room not complete. And I hope that perhaps we are there some, uh, cap uh, some uh, capable individuals who will fill it in the next couple of uh, centuries. We human beings need culture around us. We cannot live in a world with white walls and uh, make it uh, 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 progressive for our dependents. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Harry. Jean? Uh, painter, I like um, uh, Kandinsky. Kandinsky for uh, his, his balance and, um, and, and Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, Mona <laughs> Lisa. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, see. Just before we open it uh, to, to the floor, uh, George and, and Grant, we, the story is clearly based on, on a true one. You took the decision to, to change some of the names in there. I just wondered what the reason was for that and what it allowed you to do dramatically with the film. <laughs> you, go. you go. You go. No, you go. <laughs> All right, you go. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> uh, we, want, we wanted to change the names. Obviously, some of the people are pretty recognizable. Uh, uh, Rose Vallon. 
uh, was a, a, a hero in the, to the French. But we wanted to be able to uh, tell a story much like most films do. We weren't doing a documentary, and we didn't want to give any of these real men flaws that would be in any way upsetting to the, the, their families. If you had a little bit of a drinking problem or if you have uh, a little bit of a flirtation with, uh, with a, a certain um, curator, or, you know, I, we just wanted there to be our, our ability uh, to be able to tell the story without, having, uh, without offending anyone. Uh, most films do that. You know, Lawrence of Arabia isn't quite completely accurate, but we still appreciate it. I, I think that that was the point of it. Grant? I should have gone. I should have gone. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, no. That was it. We, wanted, we just wanted to be able to, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to tell the story in a compelling way, that, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and be able to fictionalize some stuff. Okay. Claire, I think you'd like to open. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a question to all the panel, please. Um, the, the film captures a great camaraderie and, and sense of humor and team spirit, and I just wondered how important that is that it existed offset as well as on. Grant? Uh, you, you know, I think if you if you talk to each, well, uh, Go ahead, Grant. yeah, it was hard to get these guys to work actually because all they want to do is play around with each other. Well, that came off. I mean, uh, <laughs> hey, hey. when I say play around with each other, really? I couldn't get out of John Goodman's room. I'll tell you, that's <laughs> uh, the quote that will be on the cover of all the magazines. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, we are all friends. We all, you know, we all get along. It was a really wonderful time and wonderful shoot, but we didn't lose sight of the idea that we were talking about uh, fairly important issues along the way, too, and so the, everybody handled it, I think, with, uh, with the proper uh, care, even though there was a, a, a lot of... Well, George actually had to work. George and Grant wrote the script, and they were producing the movie. George was directing it and starring in it. Um, <clears throat> the rest of us are kind of used to headlining movies and carrying them and and so when when you get in an ensemble like this and you're working like two days a week um it's really really fun and uh and we all just kept reminding each other to smell the roses and appreciate the fact that this we were in a really great movie with a director who was great and had everything under control and and we just laughed a lot basically matt was the only one working two days a week john I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't tell him Anybody else like to comment on the, the camaraderie of the, of the, the humor as well, which underpins it? I, I don't, I don't no. think. First time I've ever had on a film with my pants on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the spirit of everyone. Everyone that was very respectful towards uh, each other. We, we appreciated each other. I was very grateful to be cast in this film. and. Um, there was, because George did such careful preparation, um, it made each day easier and uh, more fun. And um, producer, tend to be um, interesting, true stories, maybe small um, stories that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very different from the films that you made as an actor early on in your career. Yeah. You mean Batman and Robin? <laughs> I thought you that was a little independent it. film about a, a man in a rubber suit with nipples. But I wonder if that was always part of a plan to sort of get your profile as high as possible, maybe earn a bit of money as well, and then move on to these sort of stories that you wanted to tell. No, he, he was trying to make Batman and Robin an art film. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like such a good chance. It's kind of amazing if you go back and rewatch it. <laughs> if you watch it with the sound off and not and, and the color turned off, it really it looks like an art film. Um, uh, you know, I did a lot of film. You know, early on in your career, you just take jobs because you're excited to get them, and a lot of those the, the times uh, uh, they aren't always necessarily the best of jobs. But look, every one of them led to another place for me. And, uh, and for a while, we would do films and we would say one for the studio and one for us. And, you know, as I've gotten older, it's a little less of that. We, we sort of tried to work as much of the, uh, uh, around the, the kind of, away from the comic book, you know, the big blockbuster films. And we tried to, as long as we keep the budgets down on the films, we're able to, be, you know, from Good Night and Good Luck to Eyes of March to, you know, uh, uh, Michael Clayton to uh, you know, the Descendants or Up in the Air, as long as you keep the budgets down, 
keep them way down. You're able to sort of work around the periphery of the larger budget films because they'll still make a profit. Okay, um, there are several questions in this, uh, the third row, and start with this gentleman here, and we'll move the microphone along. Thank you. It's a question uh, for the cast. Uh, it's a fascinating story, which I'm ashamed to say I was completely unaware. And of course, the movie raises the question where art belongs. Obviously, it's universal, but there are certain particular, for example, the Elgin marbles, something uh -huh. like that. Apparently, I, wondered, I got in trouble saying something about that. <laughs> I just wondered if anyone would like to comment on that particular issue because it's been a sore point of contention as you all know between Britain and Greece and it's very much a part I think of their background and their culture yet of course it or so much of it resides here and this is a sort of question that the a film like this I think throws up. Well I kind of got I stepped into one the other day I was at a press conference like this and somebody brought it up and um, so I had to do a little research to make sure I wasn't completely out of my mind. Um, uh, even in England, the polling is in favor of uh, returning uh, the, the marbles from the Pantheon, the Pantheon marbles. Um, I don't know, look, it, it, the, um, uh, the Vatican returned parts of it, uh, the Getty returned parts of it. It's not, it is a question in that case of just breaking up one piece of art and whether or not one piece of art should be as best as possible put back together. Obviously, it can't be completely put back together. So it's an argument to say, maybe that's, a, that's one of those instances. It's not about giving, you're never gonna be able to, you know, I, I think the bust of Nefertiti should be given back. You know, there's certain pieces that you look at and you think, that actually probably, the, probably the right thing to do. Um, I know that uh, some, someone, uh, yesterday said that you know it's probably that he's an American and he doesn't understand and it's like well he's probably right I'm you know it's not very bright but that can't always be the British default <laughs> setting I mean seriously <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not actually an argument you can't just say well you're American you don't get it <laughs> but Every I do think, time I do think that it, it's worth having that open discussion which is an obviously go, uh, ongoing discussion but it really wasn't meant to be you know, that was a one in about a hundred questions at a press conference from a Greek reporter asking me about the, the marbles and I said, you know, and, and I, I said that I thought it's probably a good idea that they found their way back at some point. Well, you're American, you don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the rest of the panel like to, to comment on that? You'd ask for a couple of other, other comments, returning of the, the art. It seems like it's a problem all over the world. Who owns this art? Who, where did it come from? Do, do, where it came from? Do they have the right to give it back? And I think, you know, it's had a very nice stay here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> certainly. But, uh, you know, it's, London's gotten crowded. And uh, <laughs> there's a, plenty of room back there in Greece, plenty of room. And, but Lon England could take the lead on, on this kind of thing of like, uh, you know, bringing, letting letting art go back where it came from. And then if they were all together, you know, the Greeks are nothing but generous. They'd loan it back every once in a while, like, like people do with art, right? Yeah. Um, there's a gentleman here in the third room, then a, a lady who, uh, along there, will move it and then move the microphone down. Thank you. I'll ask exactly the same question, but I <laughs> instead I will See? say, um, are any of you, and particularly you, George, with um, your, uh, your outspoken nature on this, uh, planning to visit the British Museum? It's only about a mile away from here. We're here, uh, we leave tonight at, uh, at, at yeah. the end of the premiere to go to Paris uh, to somehow insult the Parisianers about their <laughs> art. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> something about a Mona Lisa in Italy or something, I suppose, uh, that'll go over really play well. Uh, so, no, I don't think we're going to get a chance to go, quite honestly. Uh, I mean, this, this weekend or this day, this week. What day is it? I don't know. I don't either. Okay, and then gentleman here, and then we'll come to the lady. Yeah. A question for George. A lot of layers to this film. What in particular were you trying to say about the effect that art has on individuals and on society, and how well do you hope you, you succeeded? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it succeeds or not. You never know how it, how it succeeds. Time sort of figures that out. Um, what we were doing was uh, talking about the, the, the work that Harry and all of his friends, uh, all of, uh, of his comrades did, which was that it wasn't just that Hitler was trying to, to destroy, and he wasn't just trying to kill everyone and to take their land. 
He was also trying to destroy their culture and say that they didn't exist. And, uh, and that was, to, to me, that is the most important part of what these men did. They did amazing work in protecting even uh, pieces like the Last Supper that we saw, uh, which we didn't do a great job of protecting, uh, from ourselves, from us bombing, you know, and while we were prosecuting the war, which were casualties of war. But at the end, what was important was to find and return for the first time in the history of war, uh, the victor didn't keep the spoils. It's never happened before. And, uh, and it was important because, you know, when you see Hitler burning uh, Salvador Dali's and you see him burning um, uh, Picasso's, he's t telling you that this, this time period and this era and this group of men didn't exist. And, uh, and I've seen that happen in other countries. I've been to the Sudan and you'll see that it's not enough to kill them. You have to destroy all of their, all of the, uh, the, the markings that they left that were their history. So to me, what was important about telling the story was also to say that uh, is art worth dying for? I don't know if a single inanimate art object is worth dying for, but if it means that you're gonna try to erase my history and say that I never was here, then I think that's very much worth dying for. And I thought that was what these men were so brave uh, in doing, and I thought that was an interesting story to tell. Hi. Um, usually, um, war films are quite hard-hitting and overbearing sometimes. So when did you guys mean to approach it as a comedy, or was that something that came up while writing the script or during filming? Grant, would you like to start on that? Uh, we always knew that we wanted to have humor in, in this piece. Uh, uh, George and I grew up watching a lot of the, you know, the war films of our youth, and they, a lot of them had sort of a gallows humor and, and, and you know, these kind of guys dealt with this situation with humor, and we deal with life with humor. So we always knew that we wanted to have some some funny tone, but we also knew that there were, you know, we were dealing with a subject that uh, there was a, uh, you know, that was very serious in, in nature. So there was a real balancing act that we did, and that was uh, that really was the, the fun of making the piece was trying to f strike that 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 balance and that tone. And then we cast all these guys, and they brought like another level of humor to it that we didn't, we didn't write. A lower level. A lower level, that's right. <laughs> they lowered the level <laughs> of humor. Down. All right, yeah. Uh, it's a question for George. George, you were in the paper, in the area local to our paper, filming your basic training scenes, and I was just wondering if there was any basic training that took place, or was it more just uh, having a laugh together in preparation? Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, John should take that question. John? <laughs> I could understand it. Was there a lot of uh, basic training? Basic training? <laughs> Definitely. In involved in a knife and a fork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was the most basic kind of training. Basic training. <laughs> uh, Bill, did you have any uh, basic training? Did you feel? I had some basic training too. Uh, mine involved, um, I, you know, you know, it's a movie really about men, but I learned things from women on this film. I learned that when you have to put on a tight pair of pants, you lie on your back. <laughs> Isn't that right, ladies? Isn't that what you do? You put your feet up in the air and lie on your back, and then you're able to close your, the button over your belly. <laughs> I'd just like to say something about, um, we couldn't have done this film as easily as we did without the um, expert mm. knowledge of Joe right. Hobbs, yeah. who um, was from this country. I'd worked with him several times before. He is an, was an expert at, at, at military uniforms, kit, gear. Uh, he knew what belonged where to which army, and um, he had a very exacting eye, and we lost him around Christmas time, and I'd just like to pay tribute to Joe Hobbs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simon, I think you've got a question, then we move it back. And then for Matt, if I may, although Bob's not listening. <laughs> question for you, Bob. That's, a question for you. That's what we had to deal Answer with. Answer the question, yeah. Bob. Answer I'm the question. I'm so sorry. We're, we're having a private discussion. Excuse me. Okay, no problem. <laughs> having been directed by the likes of Steven Spielberg, I wondered how you assessed Mr. Clooney's skills behind the camera. And for Matt, what is it like being told to do stuff by essentially a mate? It, it, it makes you very unhappy. <laughs> um, he, Bill, Bill's impossible, but we don't talk about it particularly. <laughs> Um, what do you have to say about that, Bill? 
I think there's some confusion here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back to Bob again. How do you rate Mr. Clooney as a director compared to, say, the likes of Steven Spielberg? He's one of the best directors I've ever worked with. Uh, that's the serious part. The, the other part is we really had fun. To me, good work happens when somebody knows what they're doing. This is George. Plans what they're doing. Not works. Spielberg. Yeah. No, oh, no, no. <laughs> that <Well>, hack. <laughs> He's a really hard worker and he makes it look easy because he kind of knows the secret because he's been an actor for a few months. Um, <laughs> he knows you have to be relaxed and happy when you're working and, it's, uh, and it works. It's great. And then from that, what's it like sort of being directed by someone who's essentially it's, your it's actually friend? It's actually much easier to be directed by a friend. I, having written screenplays with friends, um, it's, it's, it's when you're partnering with somebody who's a friend of yours, um, you cut out all of the diplomacy, which really wastes a <laughs> lot of time. <laughs> And <clears throat> there's, there's all this, there's a whole way to speak, you're supposed to speak to each other on film sets or in the theater, you know, and it's all about protecting people's egos and their feelings, but when you're working with your friend, they just say, that sucked, <laughs> you know, and there's a baseline of trust and that never comes into question and you get, you, 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 pro you solve the problems a lot quicker and so it's a lot more fun, and so it makes it more fun because you're getting stuff done faster, uh, you're feeling good about what you're doing, and, um, and, uh, and you're having a good time because you're with your friends. And talking about having a good time, John and Jean Dujardin, you probably have said your adieu after the artist. Uh, how did you enjoy being reunited for this? Oui, oui, c'est un plaisir. Effectivement, c'est un plaisir. Et... Et c'est euh, toujours un... Enfin, moi, c'était très différent. C'était un plaisir d'être avec tout le monde, évidemment, et d'avoir mes scènes avec John. Pour moi, c'était très différent. C'était un plaisir d'être avec tout le monde, bien sûr, et d'avoir mes scènes avec John. Parce que ce que j'aime bien avec John, c'est qu'on ne se dérange pas. Ce que j'aime bien avec John, c'est qu'on ne se dérange pas. J'aime beaucoup... Je... Non, mais j'aime... <rire> j'aime beaucoup ses silences. J'aime ses silences. Et, et j'en ai aussi moi-même beaucoup. J'ai le sentiment qu'on commence à jouer avant l'action tous les deux. C'est toujours, toujours très respectueux et, euh, et je, même si on ne se connaît pas bien, je, je sens qu'il y, qu y a beaucoup de, de tendresse. And it's always very respectful and even if we don't really know each other well, I, I feel that there's a lot of tenderness. I love you, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know he was French. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's French, he's French. Wow. Yes. There's a lady in the second row with the next question. Hello. Um, talking of having fun on set, we heard there was um, a few pranks between Matt and George, and I wonder whether you could talk about that, please. Well, we did, you know, I actually was busy, so I didn't really do a whole lot of pranking, <laughs> but there was one situation, Matt showed up uh, early when we were about to start shooting and said he wanted to lose a couple of pounds. It looked fine, but he said he wanted to lose a couple of pounds. And so stupid of me. You should never have told me that. And uh, So over a period of about a month and a half, he would come and go. He would come to the set. He would work for a couple of weeks, and then he'd go back to L.A. for a couple of weeks. And every time he would go away, I would have the wardrobe girl just take in his uniform just like a half an inch. Uh, and he was eating like a grape. And then he, his pants were getting tighter, and I, I never actually discussed it with him. I found out only a few days ago that you, it really disturbed you. Yeah, and I, didn't, I never said anything because I thought I was being professional and trying to lose weight, and it wasn't <laughs> working. And, and uh, um, my favorite prank he actually did was, was uh, his father's in the movie at the very end of the movie, and there's this beautiful shot of him. He's in this like really lovely scene. He plays George as an old man, and he walks off into the light, you know, as he's leaving the church at the end. <laughs> And George ran the film for him, you know, um, he just privately ran the film for his dad, Nick. And, and at the end of the film, <laughs> this is my final shot of Nick walking away. It faded to black and, and a cryon came up that said, in loving memory of Nick Clooney. <laughs> and so Nick is like, what the hell, George? <laughs> and George is like, well, I mean, it doesn't come out for like six months, you know. It, it's, much cheaper, it's much cheaper to take it off than it is to put it on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a lady here in, in red, and then we come back to the second row. Thank you. Hi. Um, sadly, there are very few of the actual Monuments men still alive. You've got Harry sitting over there. What would you like to say to him? We've been saying a lot to him, so <laughs> I, 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 I would like to say, you know, 
the, the, when Dimitri, who did a wonderful job in this film, was pl playing Harry, um, the things you see in the film about uh, Harry uh, uh, leaving Karlsruhe, Germany at 13 years old and coming to New Jersey of all places, and, uh, and then uh, when he was a little older. What do you mean the fall of place? <laughs> <laughs> And he, when he came back and then joined him back up with the army, he, he in his hometown, wasn't allowed to see Rembrandt's self-portrait uh, and did find it in the mine later. But there's also, Harry, why don't you tell the story of, of, your, of your grandfather's uh, drawings as well that you found, right, in the, in, in, the, in the mine? Yes, I was able to collect my grandfather's print collection, uh, which consisted of 3,000 that he had as a hobby a group of uh, uh, hundreds, 1,500 prints that go into the inside cover of uh, books that people had acquired to have a library in their home and uh, uh, used to come along and teach them how to lead a better life. And, uh, and that was a, um, that was uh, prevalent in uh, former days before your days, and for that matter before mine, because I'm a young guy, and uh, uh, so, uh, but he was a, that was a hobby, that was great over here, and I was able to retrieve his, uh, his collection and uh, do something for my family at that particular time, in addition to doing something for my country, the USA. And uh, hi, guys. Um, sadly, Hugh isn't here today, so I was wondering whether any Downton discussions, or perhaps he's trying to recruit any of you guys, would you be tempted for <coughs> a little guest spot? Well, the reason Hugh's not here is because we didn't get along with him. We didn't. Ah. <laughs> when, we say we, when we say we all got along, most of us got along. Also not fans of, of that show, so it was all... <laughs> We're going to have to get no, he's actually quick. He's actually working. Okay. Uh, on Downton Abbey. And we are, we are all fans, and, and it was great to have the, the Lord of the Manor there. He was, uh, he was, uh, he is the Lord of the Manor. He's really fine. Uh, yeah, we actually wish he was here. He was with us in, uh, in Germany, but now he's, he's stuck working. So uh, w he's missed right now, because you would be asking him a lot of questions, and we wouldn't have to answer. That's why we're glad he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, a cameraman, I think, at the back there who's got a burning question, so if we can get the microphone just down to him, the chap in the like blue shirt. Know. His name is Russell. Mm, like we'll put you on the spot, Russ. Okay. Yeah, okay. Coming to you quickly. Thank you. Hi. Um, congratulations, first of all, on a fantastic film. Um, I think obviously one of the questions that the film really does ask is um, what the world would be like without art and creativity in it. And I'm curious, um, this is a question for all of the panel, but perhaps uh, starting with Bill, what you imagine your life would have been like had you not discovered art and creativity, and if there's a specific moment in your lives you can pinpoint where art really has mattered to you and made a difference for you. Well, uh, I think it would, it would be back when I started uh, acting in Chicago. I wasn't very good, and uh, uh, I remember my first experience on the stage. I was so bad, I just walked out, <laughs> out on the street and headed and started walking. And I walked for a couple of hours, and I realized I'd walked the wrong direction. Not, not just the wrong direction in terms of where I live, but the wrong direction in terms of a desire to stay alive. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I, um, I may be, this may be a little bit not completely true, but it's pretty true that, that I walked, uh, I then thought, well, if I'm going to die where I am, I may as well just go over towards the lake and, and maybe I'll float for a while after I'm dead. So I walked over towards the lake and as I got there, I realized I'd hit Michigan Avenue and I, and, I thought, well, Michigan Avenue, that runs north, too. And so I started walking north. And I ended up in front of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I just walked inside, and I didn't feel like I had any place being there. And they, they used to ask you for <laughs> a donation, you know, when you walk into a museum. And I, didn't, I just walked right through because I was ready to die. And uh, 
pretty much dead. And I walked in, and there's a painting there, and I don't even know who painted it, but it's, I think it's called, I think it's called the, um, the Song of the Lark. And it's a, it's a woman working in a field, and there's a sunrise behind her. And I've always loved this painting. And I saw it that day, and I just thought, well, look, there's a girl who doesn't have a whole lot of prospects, but the sun's coming up anyway. And she's got a, another chance at it. So I, th I think that gave me some sort of feeling that I, I, I too, could have, am, am a person. And, and get another chance every day the sun comes up. I don't know if anyone can top that, but can we quickly go along the rest of the, the, rest of the panel? I can't, I, can't, I can't top that. You can't top that. John, a moment I when could, you realize... I don't, I don't wish to embarrass Bill at this point. <laughs> <laughs> George. I was going to tell the same story, so I'm going to... No way. No way. No. No. Oh, boy. Well, I had an interesting experience, but it wasn't... As, as interesting as your experience, Bill. But um, a friend of ours was married to an art dealer, and uh, I wasn't quite sure what he did, and they invited us over for dinner one night. We're sitting at a table, kind of a long, skinny table, in a very simple square room in a beautiful townhouse, and it turned out he was Mark Rothko's dealer, and there were eight Rothko's, giant, it was a pretty big room, two over here, two there, two behind us. We couldn't eat, and it's interesting, because I've always struggled with certain kinds of abstract art. I mean, it took me a while to, to understand what I didn't understand about it. And some of it you can't describe in words, just being in the room with those paintings. The power really was, I mean, I was so glad because I hadn't responded much before to things that I didn't understand. And I can't say the words, but to be with those paintings in that room was a, a really, a, massive personal experience and I can't explain why it was just it was in there and it was coming out at us well we we couldn't eat I mean it was a terrible dinner actually so. <laughs> Dimitri have you a piece of art um, that's I think I'll just be reiterating what these two have said so well so I'm, I'm gonna pass okay and Jean a moment when art meant so oh, much I to you I agree <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to wrap it today. Would you show some kindness to our lovely guests today? Thank you. Thank you.